perhaps it was about that time that she began her interrogation. What did you do before going into the Army? Two years of junior college, followed by a semester at the University of Missouri, engineering. And after the Army? Another semester at MU, but studying psychology instead of engineering. How long do you plan to stay in the university? About as long as there's another degree to get, unless I get kicked out. Do you mean that you'll try for a PhD? I'll work at it. Why would you get kicked out? Don't know, maybe bad grades or something. She looked through the window into the distance. After a long pause, she said emphatically, You'll get your PhD. Did you like the Army? Most of the officers were good guys, but some of the enlisted men were a little more than animals, interested mostly in smoking, drinking, gambling, and visiting the prostitutes. When she asked if I had ever visited the prostitutes, I was peeved. After all, I felt that we were still a little more than strangers to each other. Perhaps she felt closer after having spent so many nights with me. In any case, I concluded that she knew that if I didn't want to play questions and answers with her, she surely could find plenty of other guys who would. And I could see that she wasn't asking just because of any prurient interest. She had an agenda. Still, I was rather annoyed, so in response to her prostitute question, I barked, NEVER! I had good reasons for not wanting to marry a girl from the U.S. My reasoning was that even a gorgeous girl like this one, who clearly was so much better looking than my mother ever was even when she was young, would nevertheless remind me of my mother. After all, Shaylee, like my mother, had fair skin and dark hair, and she spoke English with a Midwestern accent. My mother had grown up in Iowa, not so far from Wisconsin. So I reasoned that subconsciously my anger with my mother would transfer and damage my relationship with Shaylee or anyone like her. Having thus reasoned, I concluded I'd be better off marrying someone as unlike my mother as I could find. But the source of my resistance to Shaylee did not come solely from my resolution not to marry someone from the U.S. Unfortunately, whenever a girl, even a moral, intelligent, and attractive girl, starts showing excessive interest in me, it automatically triggers memories of a traumatic incident I had in second grade with a lovely little girl named Joan Shotliff. The first time I went to her house, she wanted to play house. I asked, well, what are the rules for this game? I'll stay in my room and you go out and I'll close the door. Then you open the door and kiss me. Yuck, I thought. On the mouth, I asked. Sure, she said. Doesn't your daddy kiss your mom on the mouth when he gets home from work? Yes, I acknowledged. But my mind was racing. I still remember my actual thought. Now, Larry, how are you going to get yourself out of this one? Her father's death the following summer transformed this lovely girl into a tormented creature that would grab me as I ran across the playground, sometimes stretching my sweater, sometimes popping buttons off my shirt, and her girlfriend screamed at me, mean boy, mean boy. So I resolved I'd never again give any girl any reason to believe that I was interested in her unless I was sure that I might be willing to marry her. And for sure, I would never kiss a girl until I was almost at the altar. And I managed to keep that resolution even though I did have several close calls prior to and after meeting Shaylee. Having thus far avoided even kissing a girl, I easily passed Shaylee's additional interrogations along those lines. I was pretty exhausted after she left, and I slept again until I heard her voice and felt her hand on my shoulder. She said softly, can you open your eyes? I turned my head toward her voice and opened my eyes to find her face just inches from mine. She said, You have visitors. I turned around and found my CO and three NCOs from my army company standing at the foot of the bed. They were looking so serious I wanted to joke, Not dead yet, but I thought it would be disrespectful not to at least attempt to offer a little salute, and I was so tired. I just couldn't muster the energy. Even though I liked these men, I closed my eyes and went back to sleep. After Shaylee decided that I met her requirements in regards to past activities with girls, she began her religious interrogation. Not having any axe to grind with her, I pulled no punches. I told her I had been a fundamentalist, but now I was an unbeliever. I figured that as a girl who was thinking of becoming a nun, that might put an end to her interest in me. 
A night or two later, Shaylee woke me up again and then stepped out of the room when I began to talk with the same men from my company. This time I was much more alert. After a chat with them, they told me that they were returning to Missouri the next morning and had brought my Class A uniforms and a few other items that I might need. The next day, Shaylee asked about the soldiers and I mentioned that they were leaving town. She stopped scrubbing my body and exclaimed, Oh, you're probably lonely and would like someone to come see you during visiting hours. After I muttered something non-committal, her disappointment was so obvious that I knew that I figured wrong. She was still interested, despite my attitude toward religion. After Shaylee's offer to visit me in the evening, I no longer felt so comfortable around her. She was just a little bit too eager. But my ignoring her offer didn't dampen her enthusiasm. And I was wondering what it would be like if I did settle down with her in this town. I looked out of the window and saw some rather old houses, not especially appealing. She must have been reading my mind for when I saw her the next time. She started the conversation by assuring me that this was the old section of town, but she enthusiastically told me, this town had some really nice areas too. Soon they removed the remaining tubes and wires from my body. When she came in that day, she said she looked at my status report that morning and the hospital now listed me as mobile, meaning, she explained to me, that she could get me a pass so that she could drive me around town. That way I could see for myself how pretty it was. I responded with a non-committal. That's a thought. Perhaps one or two days later, she began the conversation by extolling the virtues of University of Wisconsin. She ended her monologue by offering to drive me to Madison so that I could fill out the forms if I was interested. Actually, I was interested. It occurred to me that marrying this lovely girl might not be the worst fate that could befall me. I was concerned about the religious issue, but when I introspected, I was surprised to find that I actually had a warm feeling for the Catholic Church. Maybe because of so many positive experiences that I had had with Catholics, which I'll detail later, I couldn't see myself becoming a Catholic, but I certainly would be open to volunteering my services to the poor with, say, the Catholic Workers Movement. Even as an atheist, I was moved by the social gospel of Jesus. Love your enemies, he said. Even today, when's the last time you heard someone extol us to love, say, Muslim fundamentalists? And feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, caring for the stranger? Beautiful. The social gospel taught by Jesus or argued for in the book of James? Now that I loved even as an atheist. Maybe I could find common ground with Shaylee. I told her I'd keep Madison in mind as a possibility. I don't know when it first occurred to me that this appendicitis business might have had something to do with my guardian angel, but I know when my suspicions were confirmed. One day as Shaylee washed my body, she did something. Oh, I don't think she intended it, at least not consciously. But she went way beyond the pale. We were both flustered. During my confused astonishment, I heard the words that my guardian angel wanted me to say. But as always, I declined to say anything, for those words would have been construed as making a commitment to her. After she left that day, I was reflecting upon what had happened. It occurred to me to muse that even if there was a God, surely he wouldn't try to persuade me by using sexual attraction. Before I even had fully formed this question in my mind, I heard my guardian angel's emphatic response. Oh, yes, he would. Somehow, instead of becoming angry, I was amused and I left. But still, I wouldn't give an inch on my resolution not to marry a girl from the U.S. Then one day she came in and told me that she'd been transferred to another floor and wouldn't be returning any more. Now was the moment of truth. Would I ask for her address so that I could write to her? I puzzled over my reply for a long moment. At last I simply said, Thanks for telling me. As she turned and walked toward the door in my mind, I started yelling, Wait! Wait! Whereupon she broke her gait slightly and half glanced back over her shoulder. But then she was gone. When I got back to Missouri, my company commander said, There was some girl who was with you when we visited. I just looked at the ground and muttered, Yes, sir, I know. 
I entered conversational Spanish just as soon as I got back to Missouri, still intent on looking for a wife in Mexico. One day I was alone in my room, practicing rolling my R's, Rique Ricardo, Rique Ricardo, over and over again, when again I heard the voice of my guardian angel. This time he said, If you continue with this plan, you'll have years of misery. No still small voice this. I've always remembered it as making echoes in the room. Perhaps I'm wrong about that, but the voice was booming. Now I was furious. I mentally shouted back, I listened to your voice for years and I was miserable for years. Now I am an atheist. I live by reason. Just leave me alone. I could feel that presence depart. The room became chilled. The surfaces hard, lifeless. I wondered, did I make a mistake? But I resolved that I would conduct my life as an experiment just to see how far I could get by ignoring intuition totally and making decisions based solely upon reason. And so how did that experiment turn out? Did I ever meet the girl with the golden hair? As a matter of fact, I met her about nine years later, and I'll summarize my time with her momentarily. But no need to continue these stories at present, not because I'm trying to hide anything, although I must admit that it gives me no pleasure to detail my unfathomable ignorance, my impenetrable hard head, and my incomprehensible stupidity. But I let my story hang at this point because my purpose in this segment of my autobiography is to continue the exploration of Kriya Yoga. If I would have been told after returning home from my encounter on that Hollywood street corner to become, say, a Roman Catholic or a Buddhist, I'd hardly need to engage in much explanation at all. Most people know at least the outlines of what it means to be a Catholic or a Buddhist. But when I report that I was instructed to move the currents in the spine, how many people know what I'm talking about? The explanation of Kriya Yoga given in the last segment, and this one, and the next, interjected into the narrative of my story is necessary because I scarcely could continue a meaningful storyline of my autobiography without telling it from within the context of my understanding of how the world works and how I came to that understanding. 